Hello, I'm Dan Polancic, uh, the Vice President of Operations uh, for Quantum Design International. We're talking to Phil Kornbruth, a longtime uh, executive for uh, Matheson and BOC Specialty Gases, who's with us today to talk about helium and helium supply shortages and how the market looks like in the future. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Just uh, to introduce myself and what I'm doing now, uh, again, my name is Phil Kornbluth. I'm the president of Cornbluth Helium Consulting, which is a consultancy that's focused exclusively on commercial issues related to the global healing business. Bill, I, I wanted to ask you about the helium shortage 4.0 that as it's been termed. Helium shortage 4.0 started uh, in January of 2022, still going on. The shortage had a, a number of contributing factors. Let's say the handful that are most significant. Uh, helium demand uh, rebounded quite nicely from COVID-19. So you had a spike in demand uh, uh, in early 2022. And then we had a, a delay of very large new Russian project called the Amor project that was supposed to start up. It actually did start up briefly in late 2021 that would have created an ample supply situation, but they had a fire, they had an explosion, and uh, Amor is still not producing as here we are in July of 2023. So new supply that didn't happen. We had some uh, significant planned maintenance outages in, in Qatar that kind of got the ball rolling uh, to make the shortage worse. We had a depletion of a source in Australia, the Darwin plant. We had a, a fire uh, at a, um, uh, a plant in, in Kansas. And the, the other really big factor was that the BLM system was down for about six months from January through June of 2022. So add all those things together and we had a, a pretty significant shortage. Now, what has happened uh, more recently, the BLM system came back on you know, about a year ago it's uh, run pretty well since then, and some of these planned maintenance outages have not been a factor. So, you know, the shortage has subsided to some degree. There's still a shortage, but it hasn't been as bad so far this year as it was last year. But the bad news is that ExxonMobil, who operates one of the largest uh, helium production facilities in the world in Wyoming, they've just started a 29-day planned maintenance outage. And that will take us back into a more severe shortage for the next two or perhaps three months. And assuming they come back online more or less as expected, we should get back on the uh, track of a subsiding shortage in the fourth quarter. In the face of, of these unfortunate incidents and, you know, accidents, fires, et cetera, taking these various helium plant sources down. How do you see the the future for the development of, you know, the future resources like the ones that have been, you know, recently announced in South Africa and Tanzania and other places? Well, you know, the, there's a, a tremendous amount of exploration activity going on right now in the helium business. Uh, really an unprecedented amount. Like, you know, five years ago, there were no startups exploring for helium. Now there's 30 probably. You know, most of the activity is in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, some of those the startups are getting close to commencing production. I mean, North American Helium has been producing for a few years. They're the, the leader among the startups and they're continuing to grow production. They're doing uh, 130 million feet a year now. There are other startups that are approaching first production like Royal Helium in Canada or Blue Star Helium in Colorado. Avanti uh, helium in Montana. So there's, you know, there's a handful or so that are getting close to first production. The um, activity in Tanzania, that's helium one and noble helium, is still very speculative. I mean, uh, there's only been one well drilled and it was a dry hole. So until you drill a well that finds, uh, you know, helium, helium bearing gas, it's still a speculation. You know, there's a potential big project in South Africa, a company called Renergen is developing. And there's actually a, a potential big project in the U.S. that a company called Blue Spruce Operating is planning to do a feasibility study in the near term. And that could be an 800 million foot a year project, so it'd be a big project. But still, the really, the really big uh, variables for future supply, the Amore project, the Gazprom project, they're telling folks they're going to start up in September. There's not a lot of confidence in that, but they seem to be getting close to restarting. Uh, and then, you know, the question is how quickly will they be able to ramp up? 
how much will they be hampered by sanctions and things like that. But they're, you know, that's really the source of a lot of uncertainty in the market. And, uh, you know, we have to wait and see how they do. So how would you say the, uh, the, the, the announcement of the GSA sale of the federal helium system uh, on June 22nd, how will that impact the helium supply? Well, I hate to give you a, 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 a snarky answer, but I'd say, you know, not at all, uh, at least not at all in, in the near term. The, um, the thing is, uh, the sale of the assets uh, will, um, obviously the assets will uh, switch over to private ownership, and uh, but the BLM system is still gonna run. The deliverability from the helium reserve to the plants that rely on it for feed gas it is still going to be gradually declining. So, uh, and you know, there, there will be new owners of the crude helium in the Federal Reserve, but still there, you won't be able to get the helium out of the ground any faster, at least not without some significant investment. So as far as uh, affecting the supply and demand, I, I would say not much. Uh, I guess there is one other variable to talk about, and that is that the BLM has had Messer uh, as the the operator of their crude helium enrichment unit, which is a purifier. And Messer's done a good job since they took over uh, in uh, second quarter of 2022. I guess, you know, the new operator, uh, will they continue with Messer or will they hire somebody else or will they do it themselves? I mean, there are some issues around, you know, will the new operator be a, a good operator? So, yeah, that's somewhat of a, of a concern. But yeah, short term, it probably won't have much of an impact. So it seems that there's a lot of, as you mentioned, exploration and startups. What's driving them to, you know, look look for extra helium? Uh, it seems that you know there was been some major players in the helium production supply, and that shift to smaller players looks like it's coming. It's uh, classic economics. Okay, the, these shortages have driven. The helium price is up to what we would have said were astronomical levels a few years ago. And uh, they've created tremendous incentives to uh, produce helium. So just to give you an example, and you know, we're, we're starting to hear a little bit about green helium. Well, there are actually companies now who are exploring for gas that could be 98% nitrogen, 1% helium, 1% miscellaneous uh, waste gas, and they are, the price of helium has risen to a level where you can explore, drill, pipe, and produce, and throw away everything but the 1% helium and and make a really nice, uh, healthy financial return on, on producing the helium. So, you know, that would have been unheard of. Uh, you know, I don't want to sound too much like grandpa here, but, you know, when when I first started in the helium business back in 1983, bulk liquid helium at a source might have been selling for 36, 38, 40 dollars a thousand. Uh, now it easily is selling for more than 10 times that amount at the source. So you know the idea that you could drill for gas that was 1% helium, 99% valueless gas, and make a big return that didn't exist. Okay, so, you know, I, I compare it to a gold rush. I mean, it's been a little bit of a gold rush for uh, uh, for helium in the last three to five years. What markets do you see uh, developing or existing and developing that are, you know, using this particular resource? The growth areas going forward are uh, definitely going to be semiconductor chip manufacturing and aerospace. So with chip manufacturing, uh, you know, there's lots of, new investment that's uh, going on for for new fabs that will get growth going again in the US, but really around the world. So the more demand there is for semiconductor chips, the more demand there is for helium. And uh, what's interesting is the, the more advanced manufacturing processes are more helium intensive. So as the manufacturing processes get more efficient and they produce the smaller, you know, the smaller chips and all that, they're, used, they're consuming uh, more helium. So that's the big driver, even though they've been in a slump actually this year, which is one of the factors that's 
contributed to the easing of the shortage. But going forward, semiconductor chip manufacturing is going to become the largest uh, application for helium if it isn't already. The other area that I think is going to fuel growth is aerospace. That's strictly a function of uh, the more launches there are, the more satellites folks are putting into the uh, into the atmosphere, the more helium is required. And then, uh, you know, I guess I should mention that MRI, which has been the largest application for many years, is a shrinking application. And that is unlike uh, Semicon, as the technology advances, they are consuming less helium per scanner. So as the uh, new scanners get installed and gradually older scanners that were less helium efficient are replaced, the helium consumption is going down. So it appears that you know helium supplies uh, or sources will, will increase, but also demand will increase. Well, how will that affect pricing? Do you think in the future? I'm a big believer in you know the laws of supply and demand uh, apply to most commodities. They apply to helium. If and when um, Russia, you know, Gazprom gets their supply into the market in a meaningful way and the shortage ends, prices will moderate. And, you know, frankly, my feeling is that not immediately, but by the end of the decade, I expect there to be an oversupply of helium because there's going to be another really large plant built in, in Qatar that uh, will come on around 2027 time frame. 2028, 2029, 2020, uh, 2030, I think we'll see an oversupply of helium and we'll see prices considerably lower than they are today. But until then, we'll, we'll still have to deal with things like the armed conflict between Ukraine and Russia affecting helium supply and, and uh, supply accidents, uh, such as uh, fires that you mentioned. Absolutely. The issue around uh, Ukraine right now, actually, it's a very interesting situation. It's the cause of a lot of the uncertainty in the market right now. There are no direct sanctions on helium exports from Russia as of now. That could change tomorrow. As we've seen, the sanctions keep getting ratcheted up. But uh, there are sanctions that affect the um, use of U.S. manufactured helium containers to deliver helium from Russia. You need an export license to use the U.S. Uh, manufactured tanks to deliver Russian helium. Those export licenses have been denied. The majority of the helium containers in the world are U.S. manufactured containers. So when I say the majority, I'm talking probably 85 percent or something like that. Gardner Cryogenics and Air Products subsidiary is the primary manufacturer. And um, that will likely constrain the uh, amount of Russian helium that can get to market once uh, Gazprom starts up. The companies that are based in countries that don't respect U.S. sanctions well, they have U.S. manufactured containers as well, and they will use them to go to Russia to, to pick up helium. But they are not sitting on a huge number of containers that are, you know, waiting around for Russian helium because they are not the companies that signed long-term contracts to buy gas from supply. So it, it looks to me like this uh, restriction on the containers is going to throttle the rate at which uh, Russian helium can impact the market. You know, we, we need to see how that plays out, but I don't think Russian helium is going to flood the market uh, next year or whenever they uh, ramp up production. I think they'll be limited by this container issue. You know, Phil, you mentioned earlier about the shrinking demand uh, in MRIs for helium due to, you know, more efficiency and recycling. Mm -hmm. Quantum Design is a company that you know is uh, you know very involved in helium recycling. You know that that really piques our interest for the, that particular application. Do you think the other markets, such as the semiconductor manufacturing applications and for fiber optic applications, are they moving more toward recycling as well? The short answer is that applications where there's a lot of helium used in a relatively small area and uh, where the uh, contaminants are uh, air or nitrogen, they're pretty good candidates for recovery. So with optical fiber manufacturing, that fits the definition of, of a good candidate for uh, helium recovery and recycling. Again, I, I don't know exactly which uh, facilities already have installed recycling, but I know some of them have, and the ones that have not probably uh, will seriously consider it. 
my understanding about semiconductors is that helium is used at various points in the chip manufacturing process. And my understanding is that in most of these uh, uses, the helium gets pretty contaminated with all these ele exotic electronic chemicals, and it's more difficult to recycle, recover it and recycle it. So I, I don't want to say that no uh, recycling will be uh, possible with, with uh, chip manufacturing, but it's going to be limited. The other important point is, as the price goes up, and the value of helium goes up, the economics for recycling improve and you can make bigger investments and, and look at more complex recycling technologies and still earn a good return on your investment. So it's very much, um, again, goes back to the law of supply and demand. I mean, the uh, when we talk about demand destruction due to higher prices, well, you know, some of it's substitution, some of it's recycling, some of it's plugging leaks, some of it's more efficient technology, but you know, all these things, price goes up, demand goes down. Well, and, and it appears that, you know, we still have this helium 4.0 shortage continuing and with, the, again, the armed conflict affecting the helium supply, we may be dealing with, you know, shortages of helium and high prices for, for some time to come. I, I think so. I mean, uh, I, I think that the rate of price increase is probably going to flatten out because I don't think, you know, they can <laughs> double year after year. But I think the, the trend is still up for contract prices with a couple of exceptions. I mean, prices have softened in Asia where there's a pretty big dependency on the uh, semiconductor industry. And there's a little bit of uh, softening in the UAE due to competitive uh, reasons. But generally, prices are still going up. The trend is likely to continue to be up until a more really puts a dent in the market. Uh, and, you know, when that happens, it's hard to say. It could start this uh, fourth quarter this year, but more likely sometime next year. And nothing's a sure thing. Right. Phil, I wanted to thank you so much for your time once again. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Any parting words? It's been interesting. There's a, a lot of uncertainty. I, I guess, you know, if you ask me what is the the big thing right now, there is a lot of uncertainty in the market because no one really knows uh, how quickly uh, the gas prime project will introduce supply into the market. And then you have the uncertainty around the sanctions and, and how they'll uh, impact the flow of helium. So, you know, I'd say uncertainty would be the, you know, you'd like to have all the answers and have a perfect crystal ball, but that's certainly not, uh, not the case. All right, Phil, once again, thank you so much. Okay, thank you.